On behalf of Freshfields, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Phoenix Rising webinar. We have over a thousand people registered around the world to tune in. Welcome to all. My name is Tim Wilkins, and I'm the Global Partner for Client Sustainability at Freshfields. This is our first webinar to explore what I call the step back thinking we've been trying to do during the pandemic in our Business as Unusual blog series. The societal, environmental, and economic fallout from this crisis have forced us to tear down old assumptions and reconsider the relationship between policy, business, and society. We are at a crossroads. Will the pandemic cause the world to scale back on its ambitions on climate change, human rights, corporate governance? Or will we emerge in the recovery with new ways of working, new ways of operating, and new ways of governing that are greener, more just, safer, and healthier? The tragic events in the US these past few weeks add another question. Is there such a thing as a sustainable recovery that does not include racial justice and equality? As one of the Black partners at Freshfields, it has been a hard couple of weeks. But I am watching with cautious optimism as I hear a fundamentally different way of speaking about race in channels I'd never heard before. Yes, on the streets and in town halls, but also in the boardrooms and legislatures around the globe. My colleague Annette Byron and I recently wrote an article examining the heart-wrenching numbers of the disparate impact of COVID-19 on Black people and ethnic minorities in the US and the UK. We asked ourselves, are we in danger? Are our clients in danger of losing a generation of diverse talent and losing that generation just at the time when the world needs their outside the box creative problem solving skills the most? So when I hear the brave voices crying out on behalf of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, no justice, no peace, I have to view it with a sustainability lens and think this goes further. No justice, no prosperity. Without justice for black Americans and racial minorities around the world, there is no prosperous recovery. Redressing only a present day harm to restore a status quo peace will not lead to a sustainable outcome. Businesses and governments will need to address the systemic issues of racism around public safety, housing, education, and employment for the world's phoenix to rise from this crisis. At Freshfields, we look forward to working with clients as they step up their individual efforts and in collaboration with government and broader civil society to address these urgent issues. It is a pleasure now to turn to introduce this amazing panel to engage in this type of step back thinking. Our panelists represent a group of organizations that we know well. We've been working together with them for the past 12 months along with a group of 21 leaders representing universities, city agencies, and businesses to create a novel approach to moving New York City closer to a circular economy, which we will share in a report later this fall. If interest in this work, please go to circularnyc.org. But today, we want this group to lend us their big picture vision to guide us through this moment this watershed moment for the sustainability agenda. To give the most time to our panel and your questions, allow me to provide the briefest of introductions. Their full and impressive bios are set out on your webpage. Moderating our panel is Jillian Tett, Chair of the Editorial Board and Editor-at-Large of the Financial Times US and the co-founder of Moral Money. Our panelists include Vivian Alvarez, Head of Sustainability North America for Unilever, Lindsay Clinton, Executive Vice President, NYC Economic Development Corporation, Ron Gonan, CEO, Closed Loop Partners, Kelly Fisher, 
Head of Corporate Sustainability US for HSBC, and my colleague, Oliver Dudak Van Heel, Head of Client Sustainability and Environment for Freshfields. We will reserve 10 to 15 minutes at the end to take your questions, so please send them in. We'll feed as many as possible to Jillian. A small reminder, our discussion is on the record and we are being recorded. Please share your thoughts on social media, tweeting with hashtag Freshfield Sustainability or the hashtag of your choosing. Additional resources and our business as unusual blogs are available on freshfields.com forward slash sustainability. Jillian, over to you. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, Timothy, for a wonderful, rousing um, call to arms and description of what's going on right now. Um, some of you may be wondering why, from the Financial Times, I am moderating this event, given that I've spent most of my career writing about finance. But just over a year ago, in fact, almost a year ago, at the FT, we created a special platform to look at sustainability, it's called Moral Money, for those of you who have not seen it, which essentially looks at the question of what companies and investors and, dare I say, lawyers can do to try and build a more sustainable world. And I have to be honest that when the COVID crisis first hit in March, I wondered whether we were going to see the level of leadership and engagement and stories on our platform, we have a newsletter and a website, whether we would see that tail off, because frankly, companies and investors were just so overwhelmed and exhausted, they wouldn't have time to think about sustainability. And in fact, we were creating contingency plans about what we did if it turned out that interest in ESG, environmental, social and governance issues, tailed off. But I'd like to say, or I'm sad to say, that in fact, as we stand here today in June, the question of not just equity, but sustainability, climate change, and so many of the other issues that Tim has pointed to have become more and more important. So the issue we're here to discuss with this terrific panel is really what happens next? Will sustainability and ESG stay on the agenda? What can companies and investors and policymakers do in practical terms to push it forward? What should the top priorities be? And what, if you like, are the pitfalls as we try to build back better or simply rebuild and create the phoenix? So a lot of issues to discuss. Um, a great panel, which you just had introduced to you, but I'd like to start not with the corporate perspective, but with the perspective of somebody who's at the forefront of the battle in New York to create a not just sustainable world, but a thriving world. Um, I live in New York myself. I've seen the horrendous experience for the last few weeks, which frankly are still creating enormous stresses and strains and creating a city that many of us never expected to see. Um, but I'd like to start by asking Lindsay, who has basically been at the forefront of New York City's efforts to tackle the health and economic crisis and lead the economic development efforts, to say a few words on what lessons the city has learned from battling the crisis we've just lived through and what that suggests to her about the issues of sustainability going forward. So thank you for your opening, Jillian, and Tim, thank you so much for your thoughtful remarks and uh, for having me uh, for this discussion today. And good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to uh, everyone around the world who is joining for this conversation. Uh, so I oversee the industry and innovation team at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And um, usually my job is to focus on how to build up new industries in New York City and uh, inject innovation into legacy industries. Uh, my entire team has pivoted in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis uh, to focus on COVID response and in particular doing local manufacturing of medical personal protective equipment for New York City's healthcare workers. We've learned a lot uh, during this process. Um, and so I'll talk about three lessons 
learned that have a direct impact on sustainable growth. Uh, the first is what Tim was really touching on in his opening remarks. You know, the virus has exacerbated inequity, and that is a serious vulnerability for sustainable growth. We've seen that the communities most impacted um, by COVID-19 are communities of color, um, communities that are um, very often living in poverty. And uh, what we've also seen historically with regards to the impacts of climate change is that it's low-income communities and communities of color in New York City that are most affected by climate change. And so as we think about moving forward um, in the charge towards sustainable growth, um, we have to make sure that we're including all New Yorkers in that journey. It can't be sustainable growth um, unless we're thinking about um, everyone's needs. The second lesson we've learned is that this crisis exposed the risks and unsustainability of our reliance on offshore production. So back in March, March 13th, March 14th, um, we started to work with the Department of Health and the Department of uh, City Administrative Services to better understand uh, how the supply chains were not working. So many of our um, historic suppliers and supply relationships have been in Asia, and there were there was such surging demand for hospital gowns and face shields uh, coming from those traditional suppliers that it was very difficult to get uh, the medical PPE that the city needed. Uh, and so we fell back on our local manufacturing community, uh, which EDC has spent many years actually building up and supporting through our programming. Uh, we were able to call on those manufacturers who said, hey, we're willing to pivot our business to, uh, to make this uh, equipment for you. And so it was a sign of resilience, but also a sign that uh, we really need to think more about hyper-local economies, supporting those hyper-local economies, supporting local production, and thinking about circular economy, decentralized supply chains, regenerative design. And so the good, the good lesson from this is that uh, we should be making more of those kinds of investments in the future. The last vulnerability I'll touch upon is just uh, the one that we've seen in terms of our public transit system. So over the last several months, uh, ridership on our subways has gone down by 90%. And as we think about reopening the economy, we're likely to see uh, not necessarily a rush back to getting on the subways, but people perhaps going towards private car uh, ownership and use, which would be um, a step back for sustainable growth and development, but we could also see people go the other way and choosing micro mobility options like scooters and bikes. And so we need to do whatever we can to support that better outcome uh, in terms of thinking about how people are getting back and forth from point A to point B. So those are some of the things that we have um, observed and thought about and, uh, and will put us on a better path towards sustainable growth going forward. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and those are fascinating, um, quite reassuring to hear about some of those commitments as a New Yorker. Um, and I'd like to pick up particularly on the issue of the localization, if you like, of production, the focus, the focus, the focus, on, focus on um, loop economy, and really bring in at this point closely partners. Um, Ron Gonan is um, working with Closely Partners as a financial institution which is dedicated to sustainability in general and looking at the circular economy in particular. So I'd like to ask you, Ron, as someone who is involved in trying to invest in these themes, how do you appraise what Lindsay said? Is this for real? And are there going to be a lot of investment opportunities for groups like yourself as a result in the coming year? <coughs> I, uh, I think Lindsay is spot on. I agree with everything she said. And I think uh, whenever you see government and finance completely aligned in their views, there's generally a great investment opportunity. Uh, when we started Closed Loop Partners in 2014, our uh, investment thesis was focused on our recognition that supply chains were completely unsustainable from a economic standpoint, as well as a sustainable uh, standpoint. And that investment thesis did get a lot of traction. We manage money for 
many of the world's largest consumer goods companies and retailers, family offices, pension funds, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and that investment thesis was really focused on the concept of a circular economy. And what we've seen happen in the past few months with COVID is a hyper recognition that that investment thesis is really uh, the future and that we need to be more focused on local manufacturing, local communities, being able to understand uh, the flow of materials. One social justice issue that I'll uh, present to the group is that in most cities, the way waste is handled, for instance, is after it's collected, it gets driven to what's called a transfer station where the waste gets aggregated onto large trucks and then driven out of the city to a landfill. In every city in America, except for New York City, because of something we did in the Bloomberg administration, transfer stations are in the worst uh, and uh, poorest neighborhoods in the city. Those are basically the aggregators and the areas responsible for handling all of our garbage. Um, that's completely unfair uh, and it uh, creates major, major health and environmental issues for people in those neighborhoods. One thing we did in the Bloomberg administration is we created something called borough equity, which meant that there was going to be a transfer station in every neighborhood in New York and every neighborhood would be responsible for their garbage. And I think creating those types of um, programs that have fairness at their at its core then create incentive for each community to better manage their waste because they no longer have the option to just see it disappear and be handled in someone else's neighborhood. That's fascinating, Ron. I actually live just almost next door to one of the transfer stations that's being built right now. And I never realized that before. So thank you for explaining that to me. And next time I complain about trucks, I will try and tell myself it's part of my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting issue symbolically, that actually, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, but I'd like to bring in the Unilever representative right now, um, Viviana Gomez, who basically, um, because Viviana Alvarez, you have a very interesting story to tell. I mean, you are, you've been looking at sustainability issues for a long time. Unilever has been at the forefront of the drive to put sustainability onto the corporate radar screen. Um, people like Paul Pullman have really been beacons in this respect. But Unilever is a company which obviously relies heavily on supply chains or it has around the world. How are you seeing this COVID-19 crisis and the current racial issues change your perspective of sustainability um, is it going to make it more or less important going forward? And what does it mean for the world? Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody, afternoon, and thank you for inviting us in the panel. Um, very timely question, especially now as we are reflecting of our 10-year uh, anniversary of our sustainable living plan, which has helped us remind exactly about the commitments that have strengthened our business. And quite frankly, in some areas, we, we have also failed, uh, failed short. So a lot of lessons learned for us. But what is clear is that the pressures on the planet are getting worse. The social inequality has reached a critical point, which, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's even worse with the pandemic. These issues are just as urgent as before COVID. Uh, happened, and that will disproportionately affect the most vulnerable, as you know, Ron when was given an example of that. But business across sectors, governments, NGOs, academics, researchers, scientists, we've seen increasingly all of these organizations coming together at a faster pace, especially in the last few weeks. Um, we can't really put climate action on hold. We can't tell people that live in poverty to wait. So we think that you know this year is 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 one that also an enormous amount of, of public money is going to be spent to get the economy get back on track. Uh, but we should not be sticking to the economy to get back to normal because normal was something that didn't really fully prepare for a global pandemic. Um, we've not really had taken action fast enough to limit the the, uh, the impacts of climate change, inequality of poverty. So it has certainly been a period for us to reflect at the same time that obviously we've taken action with our business to accelerate a lot of our commitments. Uh, we believe that we could, we could and we should emerge stronger and more resilient than we have before. Um, we, we've, 
improve their business in different ways. You know, the way their brands are growing uh, faster when they have a very strong purpose that resonates with society, with consumers, with retailers, the way we're driving innovation based on needs and not necessarily from a, you know, purely marketing business driven perspective. It brings a very different lens. Uh, from a supply chain resilience and, and uh, business costs, we've seen over $1 billion uh, of, of costs being reduced because of water and energy efficiency in our factories, by using less materials, by producing less waste. Um, and I think, uh, Gillian, the question about supply chain resilience is incredibly critical. We've all been tested under boiling water in the last few weeks. Uh, and those businesses that have invested before on medium long term uh, solutions are, are seeing now the relevance of that in the current environment. Um, I think that more than ever, our sustainability commitments are, are, are vital. And we hope that many companies who were in the midst of, of, of that journey are only going to accelerate that. Uh, consumers, and we, we really don't talk about consumers rather than citizens and the people that we serve, more than ever are going to be asking companies to take action. You know, we've been quite surprised to see lately some of these apps where you could literally just, you know, Google the name of a company, the name of a brand, the name of a celebrity, and you can quickly look if they're really taking an action and doing something. And it's not just about reacting to the current situation, because unfortunately we're going to face many difficult things in society, in our climate, but it is how communicate this and in a very genuine way address these topics. Um, so to the, to your question, is it important more than ever? Um, our CEO, Alan Job, you know, in reflecting the last 10 years has said that more than ever, what we're going to do is, you know, take the learnings, focus and expand and focus on those big, big areas. And, we're going to focus a lot on climate inequality and waste ways not just on packaging but also you know in food given the nature of our business and there is a correlation between those three in terms of the inequality and the and the, and the communities that are being impacted hope this this answered the question i could go over and over and over you know this is really at the core wow. of our corporate strategy and i could bring many examples but just for the sake of the panel well, thank you very much indeed. And I've just put on my headphones because with wonderful timing, there's a lot of noise outside. Part of the joy of um, being in lockdown is we all have to adapt to the technical challenges and you can't always con control what noise comes out in the street outside. Um, so I hope it's not too noisy for anyone watching. Um, well, Lindsay, you raised a lot of issues there. Um, as a mother of two teenage daughters, which has been quite a challenge in lockdown, I can tell you, with online learning, um, I've certainly seen how attitudes amongst consumers has have changed really quite dramatically recently in terms of, um, you know, forcing companies like Unilever and others to rethink some of the ways they behave. And Unilever really has been at the forefront of trying to show leadership in this respect. But um, I'd like to quickly ask, um, look at the HSB perspective, because obviously investors have also been absolutely critical in this respect. And Kelly, um, HSBC has been very active in trying to champion new ways of looking at this. Um, so two questions. Firstly, how do you, from a financial industry perspective, see COVID-19 impacting the sustainability debate? And secondly, to pick up on Ron's point, are you seeing more investor interest in issues like localization um, and trying to create um, circular economy initiatives as investment opportunities? Yeah, I'm happy to address that. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yes. Great, good, okay. Um, so thank you for having me and, and happy to address that. And 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 um, first I'll say just as preamble that I started my career in this field as a wide-eyed optimist and now I'm what I like to think of as a pragmatic optimist. So. Regarding COVID and sustainability, I'm going to give you the bad news first and get that out of the way so we can end on a positive note. Um, I think the real risks that we don't come out of this better from a sustainability and climate change perspective include the amount of government funding that has had to be completely redirected to new priorities. Um, 
And the worry is that, that what happened with the CARE Acts, where several um, elected officials tried to work some bare minimum climate change protections in there and were rejected, will continue to happen. Um, and obviously, the, the economy just in general is a real risk. Um, and as several of my panel co-panelists have noted, supply chains are a real concern. Um, COVID has unearthed alarming inefficiencies in supply chains, but only brought less to those who already had less, less food, um, less jobs. Um, so that's very concerning. And then lastly, the loss crisis we had was the recession, and it caused climate change to take a backseat for up to 10 years. So that's all the bad news. Let's talk about the good news. Um, I agree with all of my co-panelists that that this has brought greater attention to climate change from some world leaders, some thought leaders. Um, I think that a lot of people say that COVID will be the frying pan and climate change is the fire. Um, I think that this has given us a chance to remember the natural world and remember how beautiful it is and how important it is to breathe clean air and, and be outdoors. Um, HSBC's own research was the first to market that showed, Jillian, as you asked, that investors care not only care about this, but more importantly, ESG per funds outperformed all other funds during the market volatility after COVID. That was incredibly important for us to get out, that out there right away and stress that. And I think that that is incredibly important following on the heels of things like BlackRock's letter in January. Um, I think that other positive news, and I'm so glad that Lindsay's here from EDC because I admire the work they're doing so much. We have elected officials like Cuomo, um, like Gavin Newsom, that have made really strong sustainability plans part of their state agendas, and I don't think they can walk away from those, and I don't think they want to. Um, other funding-related pros, um, it's now for the first time cheaper to build new renewable then then continue to operate old coal plants. That's great from a financing perspective. That's not gonna change thanks to COVID. Um, and I'll, I'll note that our renewables team at HSBC here in the US is the best at HSBC in the world and they've had a record year so far. So that means people are still financing renewables. That's incredibly good news. Um, our, our colleague banks here in the US are doing great things. Citi is transferring 100 people into a new climate change investment arm. Goldman Sachs made a $750 billion commitment at the end of last year. Um, all of those are incredibly positive things. And because the conversation turned to supply chains, I'll end on one of the ways that we see HSBC helping to come out of this. In addition to all the other sustainable finance products that we have, we are the trade bank. We are experts in supply chains. And our clients are talking to us about their supply chains now more than ever. Last year, we announced a sustainable supply chain partnership with Walmart that actually incentivizes better payments to their more sustainable suppliers. We have more and more clients that want to talk to us about that. But more, even more excitingly, they want to take research like the research we have coming out in a week with Sustainability Consortium on resilient supply chains and say, how can we take the financial incentives that HSBC is able to add and build in more resilient supply chains, move our supply chains around so that they can withstand the next crisis? So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. Well, thank you. And that is truly um, fascinating. Um, I look forward to seeing that report on supply chains because it's a very important theme. And there was a fascinating piece of research recently from BlackRock, which echoed the point that you made that ESG funds had massively outperformed, not or had significantly outperformed, noticeably outperformed um, non-ESG funds recently, but went back and looked at the previous last few periods of financial turmoil and noted that the same pattern had been seen then. And they thought initially it was because of lower exposure to energy stocks. And then they thought, actually, no, it's because any company which has got a high ESG rating has already had to look very closely at their supply chains and evaluate them for human rights and environmental issues. And the sheer act of doing that audit had forced them to think about other aspects of the resilience of their supply chain which then mattered enormously in COVID when suddenly transport and logistics were so disrupted. So it was almost an unintended benefit. Um, 
But it does raise big questions about what's going to happen to supply chains going forward. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But first of all, I want to bring in Oliver from Freshfields and ask you, how does this impact you? Because, you know, as a law firm, um, you know, you never used to be seen as being on the side of the angels in terms of looking at these kinds of social and environmental issues. Is this changing? And how do you see COVID-19 impacting your role as lawyers? Um, thanks, Julian, and, and, and hi, everyone. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you think we're on the side of the angels now. That's, I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, <laughs> I didn't quite say that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think what we're seeing is, you know, a, a change in, in in the market in our clients. And and what's unique about lawyers, and I come from a background of consulting, where you know I, I've been advising companies for for twenty years, and now working for Freshfields in a slightly different type of role. One of the big things that I notice is the difference in longevity of a relationship. Lawyers tend to be, you know, work with their clients for decades. In fact, we we were, you know, the 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 bankers of the Bank of England, the the in-house legal team to the Bank of England. 275 years ago. So that's a pretty long relationship. What that enables you is to have a real insight into the long-term benefits and needs of your clients. And I think this is where the congruence with sustainability is really very strong. What you're seeing is that there is a, a real connection between the long-term incentives of, of our clients and the type of relationships that we have with them. And of course, I too, as, as, as many in our field, are quite grateful for the, 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 the world of finance for stepping up to the plate, for the fact that we've got organizations like Closed Loop and HSBC, for the fact that we've got someone like Larry Fink taking, having a big voice, or Mark Carney for that matter when he was governor of the Bank of England. I think that has changed the dynamics significantly. And it's suddenly made people shift this whole idea of sustainability being a nice to have that we can do when we have you know, a bit of time or a bit of profit to something that is entirely strategic and that companies need to understand if they want to perform well in, in, in the world going forward. And you know, the, the, the point you made about how ESG funds are, are succeeding in this crisis is indeed due to, to, to some of the things you mentioned. I think I, I've also seen some research that, that talks about part of the reasons for that is that they're less leveraged. They tend to have less debt uh, companies that, that, that have a strong focus on ESG. They have better relationships with their employees, and therefore there's this kind of mutual trust that, that builds. And uh, in addition to the, to the supply, uh, to, to the relationship with suppliers, um, you know, they're they able to build a greater resilience in that supply chain and therefore greater resilience as a business. And I think that's really uh, showing significantly uh, in, in, in what we're seeing now. So we as lawyers, you know, we, we support in all of those things. We, we see, you know, we've got a big practice in sustainable finance uh, where we, we help with whether it's large infrastructure projects, whether it's, you know, the growth of, of green bonds, uh, uh, social impact bonds and things like that. But it also, you know, plays a part in, in a lot of the transactions that we do. You know, some of the M&A deals, you need to understand that if you're acquiring a company, you, you need to understand what kind of risks are coming with that company. The types of risks that weren't captured in, in kind of old style due diligence. We talk about human rights risk, carbon risk. That is that an understanding of those types of risks is critical to providing the right kind of service to our clients. And, and I think that's something that we really built into a lot of the work that we do. It's it's really exciting time, you know, for someone like me who's been passionate about sustainability for decades. Yes, I am that old. Um, it's it's really quite interesting to 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 you know. To, to be able to see that working with a law firm is actually enabling us to, 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 to make some of these things happen. And of course, the, the Circular New York City initiative that Tim mentioned at the outset is something that you know, it's a fantastic collaboration of all of us trying to do, use our, 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 our skills, our expertise and our influence to, to have a real meaningful impact. Well, that's fascinating. And I must say that um, when I first told my colleagues at the Financial Times that I wanted to create a platform um, called Moral Money, and it's called Moral Money not because we're trying to be religious or sanctimonious or anything, simply because we're trying to capture this idea that people are thinking about the consequences of their investments or their corporate actions um, and trying to work out whether the consequences are good or bad. Um, but when I told my colleagues at the FT, who have been covering finance and business for years, we, we should do this, you know, there was a sense of like, well, that sounds a bit irrelevant and marginal um, or activist. But of course, now it's moved into the realm of risk risk management. You know, it really is about risk management, even for, as you say, Oliver, M&A deals. Um, but if you are looking at risks 
or looking at ESG and sustainability through that risk management lens. The question I have for you, Oliver, is do we actually have the legal frameworks in place or the measurement frameworks in place yet to do this in a meaningful way? Or is that going to have to change in the next year or two to really turn this rhetoric into practical reality? I, I think that you're spot on. I mean, a, a, a lot has to change for it to become something that, that organizations do as a matter of course. But I think that the signals of that change are already happening. If you're looking at, for instance, uh, the European Commission's Sustainable Finance Action Plan, they are really putting in place a much better type of diligence around sustainable finance. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole debate around the taxonomy, defining what is sustainable in finance is a critical part of that so that you can't have people pretending that they're doing ESG when in fact what they're doing is just putting an ESG label on something that is not particularly sustainable at all. So I think all of those things are, 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 are critical. Interestingly enough, I'm, I'm sensing that, that the current crisis that we're experiencing is actually accelerating that transition. And I know this is not the case everywhere, but you know, being based in, in, in Europe, uh, in the UK, soon to be no longer Europe, but being based in, in Europe, I, you know, I, I have a, you see what's going on and, and I'm really quite right. bored by the recovery plan that the European Commission has put forward, which, which focuses entirely on the growth of a green economy and a digital economy, which of course go hand in hand. And it's not, I mean, the UK has similar plans in place. So I think there's, there's a sense there that, that we need to push in the direction. If we're going to recapitalize the world economy, which in a way is what's required now, we need to do that and invest money, funds, whether they're public or private funds, in areas of growth. And these are identified as areas of growth. And I think that's very, very exciting. Right. Um, I'm curious. And by the way, I should say once again that if anybody wants to ask any questions, do please send them over in through the Q&A function and we'll try and get to them later on. But um, I'm curious, um, I'd like to ask from an HSBC perspective, um, Kelly, when you look at this issue right now, do you think that, um, you know, there's actually the regulatory framework in place? And how, I know you're based in New York, but HSBC is still technically a UK based bank. Um, how do you see the EU um, taxonomy impacting, you know, the financial sector? Um, I think we might have lost Kelly. Kelly, are you there still? Okay, well, let's, in that case, let's bring in Ron, because I'd like to ask Ron maybe the same question, although you're based in New York, um, and also ask whether you're seeing much in the way of changing, um, changes in the type of investors who are expressing interest in the investments you're providing for circular economy initiatives. It's, I think it's too early to tell if we're seeing a change in the types of investors. The change that I am seeing is investment opportunities that we used to term as sustainable or circular economy are now just part of the general mainstream. So a year ago, if I was talking to uh, the financial community about optimizing supply chains, reducing waste, technology tools that would provide better transparency and product tracking, that would get termed as sustainability, circular economy. There was recognition that there was value in that, but, but the focus was still on are there more retail stores we can open up next quarter and can we accelerate the opening of those retail stores? And can we hit our sales numbers for the quarter in terms of moving product? The transition that I've started to see is that, and this goes back to, I think, the comment that was made on, on solar and wind, where a decade ago, solar and wind was squarely in the sustainability space for investing, whereas now it's just part of big business for most banks. I'm starting to see a lot of the circular economy topics that were always branded as circular economy now being viewed as just what you need to do in order to survive in the current business climate. And I view that uh, in a very positive uh, way. I think, unfortunately, when something gets pigeonholed into sustainability or impact, there's some type of discount placed on it, which, by the way, if you look at the data, is completely wrong. 
I'm always fascinated by how views of financial professionals are oftentimes spoken with with such great confidence, but actually completely disassociated from what the data shows. Uh, and so anytime something gets termed as impact or sustainability or circular economy, it unfortunately gets this discount placed on it. So the more that we can shift it to being just a mainstream great investment decision, uh, I'm happy with that. Well, I think like, um, may add, the fourth of the ESG funds. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Viviana, yes. Yeah, I think that that point on or what we call inclusive capitalism, hopefully it's something that is going to accelerate. You know, when are some companies are going to start the stop the conversation of a Friday afternoon sustainability and really merging the corporate strategy, because that's really the key essence of it. That's the true test that we're seeing across the different aspects of the ESGs, human capital and employees being one of them. Those companies that are doing the right thing, they're seeing it through crisis, the loyalty of the employees and the resilience of the employees. Same when we were talking about supply chains and, you know, we need to protect especially the medium and small businesses. We were one of the first ones to actually announce a 500 million euro uh, support for those medium and, and small businesses that depend on the Unilever ecosystem, because it's about the resilience of you know the most vulnerable. But one point that we've been reflecting, and as you know, I see the events unfolding in the last few weeks, is the power of the individual. And I think to Oliver's point that many things need to change. A lot of it will be accelerated by the citizens and the consumers realizing that they have the power of staying at home to avoid a pandemic. They have the power to choose products or companies that are doing the right or the wrong thing. Even, even a lot of things in France are being politicized, right? And, and the, the level of, it, of a scrutiny and transparency that we are going to go through because of the current events would make these changes faster. And it's, and it's vital that you know, we also take with pride existing programs that have been there for a while, right? So all the work that the United Nations and the SDGs have been done, they've been trying to work with the investing community for a long time. And I think a lot of those tools are ready. We just need to, you know, kind of plug them in and work with all of these existing frameworks because we don't start from zero. And I think this is where the good news is. We we, we know the, the things that need to get done. Um, and to Ron's point, you know, Partnership, and I'll give the example of, you know, the closed loop and Unilever. You, alone, we cannot tackle circular economy and waste if it's not investing in, in the infrastructure in, in, in countries where this is needed, right? So that's an example in where the multi-stakeholder model is incredibly important. Right. Well, I was very struck by the point that Tim made earlier about the fact you even have apps these days which allow consumers to keep much better tabs on what companies are or aren't doing. Um, before we go to the questions from the audience, and we are already getting some of those questions in, which I'm delighted to say, I'd like to quickly ask Lindsay, to what degree do you think greater transparency is helping citizens keep tab on what a city like New York is doing in terms of sustainability? And is that helping your discussions with investors and helping to get companies more involved in talking about circular economy issues? Sorry, Jillian, so you're asking about transparency? Yes, I'm curious about transparency in terms of how the city um, reports and what it's doing. Does that help in terms of getting more citizen engagement and trying to push towards more circular economy solutions? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I, I think the city has uh, publicly committed to um, very ambitious sustainability commitments. And I think being not only transparent about that, but being public about it, releasing um, a report every year that looks towards 2050 and lays out a roadmap uh, towards how we're going to be a more livable and thriving city. It helps for New York City citizens uh, to know where we're headed. So for example, um, we have a long-term goal to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Even in the wake of the crisis, we are still committed to that long-term goal. Uh, same thing with the buildings emissions regulations. We have some of the most ambitious regulations around building energy consumptions in the world, 
um, and in my conversations with our colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability who have put those um, <clears throat> regulations in place and advocated for those, we are still committed to them. Um, and, and even in the wake of the crisis, I think we uh, will move forward uh, towards those goals, both towards a, a milestone of 2024 and then a milestone of 2030. Um, same thing goes for renewable energy commitments. At the state level, there's a commitment towards nine gigawatts of um, offshore wind energy by 2035. And that commitment is still in place and the state and the city are still, still working towards those commitments. I think being public right. about those goals um, enables corporate partners and investors to understand where New York City is headed. Um, and, and to have more certainty about uh, about our direction. Right. Well, thank you. Well, we've got some great questions coming in, so I'm going to pick up on a couple of them. Um, starting with one specifically for Viviana. Um, Unilever, are you already seeing, just in the last two or three months, consumer behaviour change towards more sustainable products? That's a question from Elizabeth Sandler. Well, thank you for that question. I, I we get that quite often. And at the beginning, you know, we were, we were hesitant on the data because it was changing so rapidly. And really depends on where you ask these questions. You get very different results. One one thing that I'm certain is that uh, science based information is going to change a lot of the perception of sustainability for products, uh, in in different aspects. Um, People are demanding sustainability as a as a must have. They don't want to trade off, obviously, with price and quality. So I think we're what we're seeing is more consumer demand on companies and products doing the right thing. Um, obviously, the frequency of the household grocery and shopping trips have decreased. You know, likely causing consumers to purchase what is available uh and before prioritizing sustainable options and that's because you know of, of all the challenges uh given covid for supply chain i can tell you that you know because we produce basic health and hygiene home care and foods uh products we are at full capacity and we but we would also see a lot of innovation coming from this and we're trying to understand the new you know what the new normal might look like for the consumers and what does sustainability mean in that so what i think is going to help us understand is new shopping behaviors new models that you know people are more open to and and uh, and more willing to test and adapt right um it, it'll take a while to understand you know i think we're still a little bit not right well thank you that's fascinating um Question for probably Lindsay and Ron, maybe Kelly as well, which is infrastructure and the muni market, muni bond market is a huge part of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, the COVID-19 recovery and issues of justice, do the panelists have any thoughts regarding linkages between the public and private sectors on some of the issues, supply chain renewables being discussed here? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Um. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. Yes, no, please do. Uh, sure. So I, I think governments have a great opportunity to spur job growth by working with major companies to bring their supply chains and manufacturing into their local regions. Today, uh, and I'm speaking in generalities, but today, when a product is made, um, raw material is, is mined someplace. It then goes to another place in the world to be processed, another place in the world to be manufactured, another place in the world to be packaged, and then uh, comes to that municipality or that region. It's used once, and then it's shipped someplace else to go to a landfill. And then we start that process all over again. That is a process that is definitely in the best financial interest of the extractive industries and the landfill industries, but it's not in the best financial interest of consumer goods companies, retailers, consumers, or municipalities. And so I think we're now in a phenomenal uh, space for municipalities to work directly with major consumer goods companies and retailers to say, how can we build a local 
supply chain and manufacturing system where we continually reuse and remanufacture with materials that are being used within this region. And if we can build those types of systems, uh, government is going to create a lot of local jobs and government's going to significantly reduce their budgets because they're going to avoid landfill disposal costs and consumer goods companies are going to be able to also reduce their costs because they're not shipping material all over the place uh, and also significantly improve their, their sustainability record. Kelly, I know that you had wanted to come in uh, just before and if you had any further thoughts on just that issue about how municipalities um, or government can play a role with the private sector. I thought Ron uh, addressed it very, very well. And we are seeing a lot of our clients, including I would say a large, uh, large number in the apparel sector thinking about where they're sourcing their goods and where they're manufacturing their goods. And there's a lot of potential, as Ron said, to localize it or think of smaller supply chain distances. Um, there's another question in here that I think is excellent if you'd like me to address it um, about social issues uh, taking a back seat um, to environmental ones. Yes, um, I, I, that's I just actually saw that. Been, Please go ahead. That's, yeah, that's something I've been incredibly proud of what we've done at HSBC. And I think that we can all push harder on given what COVID has taught us, given what Black Lives Matter continues to remind us is that the two are intertwined. Um, and I thought Jillian opened very nicely by touching on this, um, as did you, Timothy. Um, so at HSBC, we've done some innovative things around that. We issued the world's first SDG bond that was not tied in any way to environmental SDGs, but entirely human rights SDGs. And when COVID hit in February, we issued the first COVID bond with the Bank of China Macau. Um, regarding supply chains, I, I'm hopeful that our clients who want to talk about their supply chains, because we have conversations with them again and again about their supply chains, the same financial incentives we put in to incentivize envir better environmental behavior in their supply chains, we can use for their human rights programs. And a lot of them, especially the apparel companies, are doing some really incredible programs for predominantly the women that work in textile mills to educate them, to give them access to clean water and sanitation. Financial incentives can be put in place to drive those as well. So like I said, I'm, I'm very cautiously optimistic that COVID will remind people that the environmental and the social have to go hand in hand. So I was really happy to see that, that Fiona asked that question. Well, thank you. Um, I have to say, I'm just looking at this incredible stream of questions come through, and I would love to um, pick them up, you know, one by one and talk them through. I think it probably would take about another two or three hours. And I think that actually reflects the same point we're seeing with moral money, which is that there is this explosion of debate and interest in the sector right now. People are looking for answers, um, and there's going to be a lot more to discuss and talk about. Um, just one thing I'd say from listening to this discussion so far, and we are sadly coming up to the end of the session, that um, what COVID has shown us is, or COVID-19, are what I call the four S's. That basically science matters, whatever your politics. Um, systems can create incredible contagion in today's world. That society matters in the sense of the weakest link of the chain of humanity. If that breaks, we all suffer. And as Kelly just said, sacrifice is something that societies are willing to make. In fact, I think it was actually Viviana saying that, pointing that out with Unilever. And social change is actually a real thing. It can happen. And in my view, what we've seen in terms of what's been happening with COVID applies very much to the environmental debate and will probably imply to a certain degree to the debate around equity and social factors too. So it's been an amazing discussion. I think that you've touched on a number of very important themes in the last um, hour or so. Um, but I'd like to hand over to either Tim or Oliver, perhaps, to wrap up and thank you for hosting this very important debate. Uh, thank you, Jillian. And in fact, um, we are at the top of the hour, but I did want to thank each of the panelists, um, Lindsay, Ron, Viviana, Kelly, and of course, uh, Oliver, for your thoughtful conversation. And 
Jillian's right. This discussion requires demands a lot more conversation on this type of deep level. And what we've been finding is that it's really the convening of conversations with groups from business, from finance, uh, university think tanks that actually are able to move the uh, debate forward and come up with the type of novel and innovative solutions that we started to discuss here. Um, of course, we would like you to please go to uh, freshfield.com uh, forward slash sustainability. We have a lot of writing on this, but we also just encourage you to engage um, more broadly with your colleagues and your peers um, on this topic, because it will be a collaborative effort for us to move forward. Um, thank you everybody for joining us again this morning. And uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion and making real progress in the near future. Thank you.